Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to do a follow-up on the sort of fetch judgy Fiat story. I did a video on this a little bit before, and I blanked out the names when I did, because whenever you're dealing with something like this, it's hard to determine if criticism like that is fair. Um, I noted in a pinned comment that it seemed like it was a little over the top, and I also noted that there's a bit of a power imbalance as between, you know, judges and lawyers. In fact, there's multiple sort of and complex power imbalances. Well, uh, there's been a development, which is a follow-up FIAT, and I think it's worth going through because it provides a fair bit of context and additional explanation. It's also got some stuff in it that I think is worthy of comment in and of itself. Uh, the other thing is that often with these stories, the initial story has way more reach than the follow-up because um, the initial story is funny and, you know, gets, uh, gets a lot of eyeballs that way, whereas the follow-up you know, when there's a correction or something along those lines, um, people tend not to hear about it, and that can cause tremendous damage. So I think that there's a bit of an obligation on me as a person who commented on the first one to comment a little bit on the follow-up and, you know, try to provide some explanation to the people who might have seen the first one. So let's uh, dive into this follow-up fiat. Um, I blanked out the names on the first one. I'm still blanking them out on this one, um, again, because... I, I felt like that was fair the first time. I don't see a reason to change that uh, this time. So, Fiat, March 4th, 2021. On February 18th, 2021, I issued a flyleaf Fiat that is not intended for publication and usually not widely distributed on this matter. In it, with colorful, la or colorful and informal language, I chastised Defendant's Counsel, Mr. G, for what I took to be sloppy practice. Since that Fiat was written, two things have happened. First, it went viral receiving inordinately wide distribution throughout the country. This elicited strong and polarized opinions on the wording of that fiat. Second, I have now been advised of background fact leading to the application being submitted in the manner it was filed. I was not provided with that background at the time of writing the fiat. Had I been, matters would have proceeded differently. In Canada, judges, except sometimes chief justices, generally do not give press conferences or comment publicly. We only speak through our judgments. Ordinarily, I might let this matter lie. Under the circumstances, particularly regarding the manner in which Mr. G has been treated on social media, I believe it would be wrong of me to stay silent. Thus, I issue this secondary and explanatory fiat. I note I have done so unprompted, entirely at my own initiative. I will firstly deal with the background facts of which I was previously unaware, as they were not on the court's file when I dealt with the matter. This will strike some as mundane, but the context is important. I will then uh, move on to the more important matter, that of remedying any damage Mr. G's reputation may have suffered. Mr. G was retained by the defendants. They had been noted for default, meaning they had failed to deliver defense to the plaintiff's claim within the time limited by our rules of court. Mr. G quite properly sought to set aside that noting, which would allow him to file a defense. Uh, when you're noted in default, it uh, basically means that because you haven't filed a defense, um, the the process or the uh the plaintiff wins but uh these are frequently set aside when somebody's got a reason why they haven't delivered a defense um this happens all the time and quite frequently and quite properly uh often by consent so that's really what's happening here uh he obtained consent from plaintiff's counsel and attempted to file same he was then advised by one of the court clerks that a full application was required and the consent documents were returned to him there was miscommunication on this point the rejection of Mr. G's documents, in fact, was incorrect. Saskatchewan's Rule uh, 321 sub 3 actually gives a defendant two procedural options when noted for default. The defendant can obtain the plaintiff's consent to filing a defense. Alternatively, a full application can be made uh, to the court for an order allowing a defense to be filed. A full application is not always required. Unfortunately, and notwithstanding uh, following the uh, rule's first option and obtaining consent, Mr. G says he was advised by a court official that he had to file a full application. And when you're advised by a court clerk that you have to do something, um, that's pretty much it. You, the clerks really run the show. So, and I don't, I'm not here to criticize the clerk. Mistakes happen. We all make mistakes. Uh, but, you know, when, he, when you run into that, there's sort of two ways you can do it as a lawyer. Option number one is you make a big stink and you try to sort of force your way through with what you think is right. 
Now, that's often not the best strategy because A, you might be the one who's wrong, and B, it's always good to avoid making enemies if you don't have to. So, it looks like Mr. G pursued a different strategy, which was to uh, try again, essentially, and that seems sensible to me. So they say, Mr. G then obtained a formal consent order from the other lawyer and filed same. The matter was placed before me. I have spoken with Mr. G, and he was under the belief that his previous documents were before the court. They were not, and I had no knowledge of their existence. Believing we were operating solely under option two, requiring a court application, and entirely unaware of the previous interplay between Mr. G and courthouse staff, I was nonplussed by the filing of a bare consent order. This came in the overall general context of something of a recent deterioration in standards and attention to detail in applications placed before the court. This is a practice that needs to be curbed. I have commented on same in previous decisions. Knowing Mr. G is a very good lawyer with a corresponding sense of humor, I drafted my fiat in language that has now become somewhat infamous. Several points flow from this background. First, had I known about the discussion with the court's uh, clerks and the misinformation provided, I would have written the first fiat differently. I did not have all the facts before me. None of Mr. G's documents pertaining to consent were before me as they had not been accepted for filing, although Mr. G quite reasonably believed those documents were on the court file. As well, I had absolutely no intention to malign, bully, or embarrass Mr. G. The wording of my initial fiat, while unintended to be harmful in any way and intended to soften my criticism with humor, has blown up in my face. As noted, I have known him for many years, decades in fact. He was my student in a class I taught in law school. He is highly capable counsel. I'm guessing that that class was civil procedure. Uh, he has appeared before me many times doing high quality work. He enjoys an excellent reputation within the practicing bar and before this court. I regard him as a valuable member of the profession. He is a very good lawyer and a great guy. His sense of humor and easygoing manner is well known. He can make and take a joke. It was uh, with all this in mind and with an incomplete record that I drafted my first fiat. My last wish was to cause him harm or upset or reputational damage. I appreciate that, while unintended, my fiat has done exactly that to Mr. G. How it gained such wide distribution so quickly remains a mystery, but it did. I'm utterly chagrined that it affected Mr. G in this way and so publicly. As a result, within this present fiat, I unreservedly apologize to Mr. G, his family, and members of his firm for all upset or trouble I have caused, however unintentional it was. Such was never my aim, yet it has occurred, and none of that was his fault. I have apologized to him directly, person to person, openly, and sincerely, and he's graciously accepted. But that private apology was insufficient given the public nature of the harm done to his reputation. Hence, this new fiat. So, uh, first, I want to give the judge or the justice here some props for, I mean, this is a, a I like this apology. It's a fairly sort of good apology. Um, there are some things I want to sort of comment on in it, but I want to give the judge some props for taking this step because um, this ordinarily the court, as they note, doesn't communicate in this fashion. But this is a situation where they sort of accidentally caused harm to somebody. And I think it's proper that they take steps to fix it because uh, the court is really all about trying to remedy harms. That is a lot of what, especially the civil court, is about. And so it's, in my view, proper that they're trying to remedy a harm that they caused by the initial fiat. Um, there is some deflection going on here, in my view, uh, where they, you know, say, how could this have gone, you know, viral and this is so unexpected and so forth. Well, uh, court filings are public communication. I mean, the courts, barring some other uh, principle like a publication ban or the like, uh, we have open courts and uh, court judgments are essentially communications not just with the parties, but also with the public at large. And so whenever you know, any judgment has the potential to gain widespread attention. And this one did. And the reason why it did was precisely because of the language in it. Um, had it just been sort of sternly phrased, um, it certainly wouldn't have gone, you know, the way it did. And so it looks like there's, you know, it's easy to sort of assume that these things are more private communications. 
Um, it sounds like this was intended kind of as an in-joke between the justice and the lawyer, uh, but instead it kind of exploded. But that is to be expected, especially in the modern era. Uh, we all need to be careful with our communications because they can go further than expected. The other thing is that this really, I think, illustrates uh, that it's worthwhile being charitable to people. Uh, and I mean that not in, you know, not limited to the sense of, you know, giving to the to people who are less well off, but just in the sense of, you know, if you see somebody making a mistake, um, assume that there might be a reason for it. There might be, you know, something might be going on or, you know, as in this case, it might be that they've been trying their best. They've been doing their best to sort of solve an issue and, you know, that they haven't done anything wrong. I personally remember an instance where I'd arrived in court and the judge uh, believed and from the position of the judge, uh, quite fairly believed based on the information that was available to that judge. But that judge believed that I'd basically made a mistake and screwed up and screwed up in a way that was going to be disruptive to the court process. Uh, in actual fact, what had happened is that... Uh, I was stepping into a role to help out the court, but the judge didn't have that information. And so the judge um, chastised me saying, you know, you have made an error. You have, you know, you're inconveniencing the court. You're causing disruption and chastised me for quite a lengthy period of time. Um, and then eventually asked me what I had to say for myself. And I was able to explain that essentially I was taking on a role at the last minute to try to help out. And, you know, the judge went, oh, you know, sorry about that. I, I didn't know. But, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to fault this judge. There's, I'm, there's a reason why I'm sort of cutting all of the details out so that it's not something where you can track it down. Uh, but things happen, you know, and sometimes we're inclined to assume the worst or bad things about other people when in fact it's not called for. It's also worth noting that lawyers kind of, we rely on our reputation. Um, it is something that can be necessary in terms of how we relate to clients. Um, and clients, for instance, may, especially in the modern era, um, search out somebody's name and, you know, have a look and see, is that lawyer reported in the media? And I mean, now this lawyer is unfortunately going to be reported in the media by that name. And, you know, there's a reason why I redacted the name uh, when I was initially, uh, you know, covering this one. Um, reputation before the court is also really important because uh, when you go in and you tell the court, you know, here's what's happening, uh, you want the court to be able to just accept that. You want the court to, to say, yes, we trust Mr. Runkel. Uh, if Mr. Runkel says it, then it's good. Um, so that is another sort of essential thing. And the other thing is that if courts have heard sort of through the grapevine that you are a problem, you know, kind of a problem child, that you are somebody uh, who keeps screwing up, uh, they're not likely to give you much leeway. Whereas it sounds like, you know, based on what the, uh, the justice here has said in terms of the follow up, in terms of this uh, sort of clarification and apology, that uh, this is a lawyer who is one who follows the highest standards. So that all of this is kind of important lessons here. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, this is really something that courts and everybody else in the justice system has to consider is the potential for things to get away from you. Um, everything that happens in a courtroom is at least theoretically public. Uh, if I go and make an argument in a trial, even if there's not a member of the media sitting there, um, somebody could pull the transcript sometime later and the media could report on it. So all of these are things we have to consider. We're always under a lens. And I mean, it's one of the less fun parts of the job, but the job's got other uh, other fun bits to it. Anyway, um, I that's sort of my commentary on this. I feel... Um, this one's not as funny as the initial one, but I think it's more important because it's more important to help spread this attempt to correct the initial damage than it is to, you know, sort of... I like when people are involved and engaged in the justice system, and I think sometimes humor is an important way that people are able to do that. Um, there is a place for humor. 
uh, in in the justice system. I absolutely believe that there's a place for uh, humor and plain language and for that sort of thing, uh, for making decisions accessible. I would love to see more decisions written in a fashion where um, where it doesn't necessarily need a lawyer to explain it, uh, but instead, you know, it could just be read. Lots of decisions aren't in that fashion. So I do like the idea of accessibility of interesting law, but uh, there's always, you know, an interplay here. And at this, in this case, it sort of came at a personal cost. Anyway, thank you for watching. I do hope that this has you know, been interesting, that it's uh, provided at least some clarification and some food for thought. Uh, I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Demo, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Canada's National Farms Association, uh, Jason Elliott, North Central Process Service, Jean-Guy Jean Toussaint, uh, Kyle Martin, at the, and at the $20 level, Cameron Johnson, Dale Nesbitt, and Andrew Elsich, and at the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited, as well as a number of you who will be in the crawl immediately following at the $10 level. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.